All right, everyone. So um, I am actually uh, in a new classroom uh, now that we are now fully online. Um, online. Uh, no reason to go back to the same classroom, and I like this one much better. So I just broke in, and hopefully the um, it's a little bit of a better view, I think. So let's see how this goes. Uh, see, we don't really have too much time left in this semester, and so it's kind of a good thing given the circumstances. So. Uh, anyway, with that said, I'm, um, we have to think about how we're going to wrap things up. And today we're going to wrap up perturbation theory, then the variational, uh, the thing called variational theory, which is uh, definitely an approximation method. And after that, we'll do some more, we'll do some computational stuff, and that will pretty much bring us to the end of the semester. Okay, so let's review where we were at before. Oh my God, look how this is kind of messed up. Anyway, let's take a Hamiltonian. And let's break it into two parts. And oh, that little bubble goes on the bottom. That's important. OK, so like, I, like last time, uh, this part is like what we're going to do is we're going to make that like a hydrogen Hamiltonian. So we'll solve hydrogen wave functions. And this part is a problem. This part, the Hamiltonian, especially in the case of hydrogen atoms, if this is like like if it's a helium atom, this part would be electron, electrons interacting with other electrons. And as I mentioned, I think I mentioned this last time, all of a sudden you can't solve the wave functions for the full Hamiltonian anymore. Um, mathematicians even weighed in. They said, you know, no, it's not that you're just not good enough in mathematics. There is no e to the minus r over a, you know, there's no, um, it's an analytical form. There's no analytical solution. So what perturbation theory is good for is we'll take hydrogen atoms without electrons interacting, and we'll figure out a correction, a perturbative correction for the electrons interacting. So that's one example of what this is good for. OK, now I recall that what we do is we, this is weird, this is very weird, we multiply the potential energy the part that is the sticky wicket, the hard part, we multiply that by lambda. We're going to lambda go from 0 to 1. That's the idea. Uh, the first thing was, here, let's, let's act on the right um, by the wave function. And of course, the Hamiltonian is broken up, just, just like I just did, uh, lambda v. OK. Uh, the first thing to do is, as I mentioned, the derivation in the Sakurai book justifies what I'm about to do, but other derivations, they just do it. Because to justify the expansion of, here's what I'm going to do, is I'm going to expand the wave function in, in terms of lambda. To justify that means that the, the nature of the derivation itself is going to change radically, and it becomes really hard to understand. So if you can just accept the fact that I'm going to expand it this way, as though it's a Taylor series, then the rest of this is very easy. So that's, that's great. It's just, but why am I doing this? And that's hard. Um, don't, don't forget that X on the whole thing. Uh, this is also the solution. This, so in my example of we're, doing high, we're going to do helium atom, but we're going to pretend that it's a hydrogen atom and the electrons interact as the perturbation. Uh, this is the hydrogen atom wave functions. And then these are the corrections to higher orders, meaning that, you know, in terms of what's wrong, 90% of what's wrong is fixed there. Um, an additional 9% is fixed there. An additional, right, so as you go to higher orders, the degree to which you fix the unperturbed solution is you know largely fixed here. You get a little bit more of a fix there, and then on and on and on. So that's the idea. Now, what I ended with last time is again another really funkalicious thing, which is that I am also going to have to expand the energy. Now, I explained that last time. Um, what happens is is that if you just say I have energy times this expanded wave function, it, it doesn't work. And, and I explained that last time, so I'm just going to leave it at that. So hopefully you remember that. Uh, anyway, so I have to expand 
the way the energy as well, and to say that there are higher order corrections to the energy where this is this would be the energy of a hydrogen like atom. So again, we're going to do helium. So this is the energy of of um, of helium as though it was hydrogen. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, does it? Um, it's the energy of a hydrogen atom with two electrons, and the electrons aren't, aren't interacting. You'll see more because we're going to do that problem. This isn't right, so this may be of, of how much error is there that adds back in 90% of how much you're off. Uh, then, then this part, this second order correction, adds an additional maybe 9% of what's wrong, and, and you're still, you know, you're 99% you're way there, but so you have to go to higher and higher order. Uh, but of course, we won't. We'll, we'll stop this at, at this point. And of course, then we still have to. Um, <laughs> oops, we still have to have our, our wave function in the normal eigenvalue way. And again, we stop at a certain order. Um, and, and again, the saccharide book. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna make some match terms. The saccharide book. Um, you know, you, you, you see explicitly how these go on to infinity, uh, but we can't really do that in this approach. But we don't need to, it's fine. Uh, okay, now recall that when you then foil this out, which is a bloody mess, obviously, uh, what you find is that when you group terms that have lambda to, to the zero, you get a very familiar expression, the Hamiltonian unperturbed acting on its states give the original energy, so that again, this would be a hydrogen-like energy uh, times the wave function. So, so this is perfectly sensible, so that the lends credence to it. All right, so when we group everything that's a lambda to the one, uh, we get this. Um, and I won't write the lambdas. All the lambdas will cancel. Um, and we will see. Um, we, we got to take apart this thing, and we got to find what we're looking for. So let me just write all this out. Okay. Now we're going to assume that we know what this is. I mean, if you don't know what this is, then, the, then why are you working on a perturbed problem when you don't when you don't even know the unperturbed problem? So that doesn't make sense. So we know this. Okay. So if we know this, then. I know what the unperturbed wave functions are. I know what their energies are. So it looks like I have one equation with two unknowns, which is often the problem in quantum mechanics. You, you want to know the energies. You also want to know the wave functions. But you have one equation with the two unknowns. What's the wave function? What's the energy? And of course, the clever mathematics that we develop, we still can solve it. And we have the same problem here. Um, probably we're going to want to get the energies, because energies are observable. And um, so we might want to solve for this first. And then later we can figure out what the wave functions are. We'll figure that out in a second. Um, so and then we also have terms grouped to second order. And we'll solve the energy. We'll solve for the uh, second order energy. But no one, I, I've never seen anyone worry about the wave functions for uh, a second order correction, usually just the energy, energy is usually what people are trying to get to. Um, that's that's some kind of observable. Um, and you may notice, if you look carefully, you may notice that there's there's a bit of a pattern in terms of the order of the correction. Okay, so and when we do second order, obviously we solve the first order. So what we're going to be looking for, actually, we won't try to solve for the wave functions because, again, we're kind of beating a dead horse at that point. Uh, we're going to have to look for the second order energies. All right, anyway, so of course we're going to work on this guy first. And again, the approach, the traditional chemistry approach, uh, look in the handout section of uh, Blackboard. Uh, it, as long as you don't mind how I wrote this out, this is real easy. So that's why I like doing it this way. Um, okay, so we're going to do the first order, and, and I'm going to switch now to bra cat notation, which is not what the X, you know, that supplemental thing I have in Blackboard that does not use this, um, but it's straightforward to see. I mean, look, look at what's up there. 
Uh, I'm just writing that wave function as a cat now, which you know turns into a wave function by application of a, of a positional bra or, or an integral, but whatever, or re resolving an identity in space. But yada, yada, yada. Okay, so there's this. And another reason, as I mentioned, at this point, it's really not that hard. Uh, but I, I would contend, if you look at the what's in the text versus what I'm doing here, I think what you would find is that what I'm doing here is even makes it slightly easier. Uh, because, I mean, that's the whole point of, of Dirac notation. Okay, now let me, let me double check. Um, oh, the, the problem is that that looks like, there we go, that looks like a zero. Okay, otherwise the world would explode. Um, yeah, all right, so, so that's fine. I, I just translated this into direct notation. Uh, okay, now, now what we want is expectation. You solve perturbation theory with expectation values. So to do that, of course, I gotta multiply by a bra, and uh, why don't I multiply by the, uh, on the left, I'm gonna apply the unperturbed wave function, unperturbed state, uh, project onto that. And that's just because, guess what, that will lead to the answer real quickly. I mean, nothing says I, I could I could project onto x or p, uh, but if I do this, then guess what, then I'm going to get to the answers real quick. So I don't want you to think that there's anything magical about this. It's magical that it makes it easy. That certainly is a form of magic. So. Uh, let's see what happens. Oh, you know, here's one reason, and here, here's where the magic happens, is right here in this first term. Let me write all this out, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. And I tell you, um, you know, I, I really struggled with the idea of would I do this class using Dirac notation, or would I do this in the traditional way, which Nothing is wrong with doing things traditionally um, because that's, that you know puts you on the same footing as everyone else, which is which is kind of good. You know, you don't always we always say, oh, it's good to be different. Well, maybe I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily do that. Okay, so let's see what happens. Now that I wrote all this out. Okay, so the magical part, the part that's going to make this easy, is I'm going to use the fact. Oh, Zero. Uh, Hamiltonians are always Hermitian, so I'm actually going to act on the bra and not the cat. And, and again, it's, it's arbitrary which one to act on, but, but I know that this state is the state of this Hamiltonian, so that's what's going to make this easy. Um, okay, there's not much I can do about that. Uh, energy, of course, the bra just passes right through the energy. Um, you know, for, uh, zero with order correction, first order correction, so there's not much to say there. Okay, here's the neat trick. When you act on when you act on the left, which again, Hermitian operators can act left or right because they, they are their own adjoint. And you know what? I, I hate to do this to you, but I have to write the whole damn thing out again. Um, really needed some kind of electronic uh, board, which I've seen um, people are trying to to sell now where it's like PowerPoint, but a um, oh, oh, little dash goes there for first order correction, which this is what we're trying to find. Uh, so it's like a mixture of PowerPoint except on the board. Okay, okay, so let's see here. Um, okay, what's important is notice this term. So as, as I mentioned to you, you set this up to simplify things to be as fast as possible. Look at that. And just they're the same term across an equal sign gets wiped out. Okay, that's cool. What's that? Always, <laughs> unless you're some kind of moron, your wave functions are normalized. Don't not work with unnormalized wave function. And as you're going to see here in a minute, when I do some applications, I'm going to talk a lot more about normalization. Not, I mean, you know what it is. I'm not saying you don't know what it is. I'm going to show you how important it is to double check that things are properly normalized. Anyway, so this is one. Look at that. And look, that's what we're trying to get. Oh, hell, look, we're done. <laughs> I mean, let's check it. Check it out. We're done.
you know, I'm just trying to, to find the first order correction to the energy. So, sorry, I'm not doing that dash right. It's one. One means first order. So again, you have this perturbation. Without it, you have everything. You know the Hamiltonian, you know the wave functions and energies. But with this perturbation, that just ain't right anymore. So you add corrections. But the correction to first order isn't going to like completely solve it. It may, you know, of, of, of the error, you want to capture 100% of the error in the wave function and the energy. This first order will capture a large portion of that incorrectness and fix it, but it won't fix it to 100%. So you'll have to go to second order, third order, and really infinite order, and then, then you've got a perfect solution, but of course that's impossible. So the first order, that's the correction to the energy. So however much your energy is off by solving this thing, but without the perturbing potential, this goes a long way to fixing that. You just tack that on to the unperturbed energy. And we're going to do an example so you see exactly what I mean. And you'll see how much first order corrections fix things. OK. Um, now, just to make sure that we're, you know, <laughs> two lectures ago, we practiced our our Heisenberg time dependence with the harmonic oscillator, even though we had done it to death. Let's practice, let's practice our Dirac notation. Let's do two resolutions of the identity to make sure we know how to evaluate that. So um, again, I, um, I just put this in here because I just want to make sure that you, you, don't, you don't forget how to do this. OK, so I'm going to do x. I have two of them because now I've got an x prime. So now I can see the wave functions. Okay, so um, uh, let's see here. Um, now the position is, well, sorry, potential energy. It's always a function of position. So it's a function of positional operators, and those operators, when they act on the, uh, they can act on the bra or the cat, right? Because they're Hermitian. Um, I'll have them act on the on this one just because I feel like it. Um, so we get a. We still have a double integral. Um, uh, you're going to get v of x. Um, it's really v of x operator. I should have written that, sorry. Um, then we've got, um, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm not, see, I'm the one who needs practice, apparently. Oh, you don't ever want to get, get out of shape here. Here we go. I almost screwed that up. Okay. Then what you've got is um, the delta function. There we go. Okay, and of course we know that this is a Dirac delta function. So what you end up doing is you kill an integral, you get one less integral. And whenever you see an x prime, wherever you see an x prime, write an x. So we end up with the integral. Uh, again, we know that as the complex conjugate of the zeroth order wave function. And, um, and that is just the regular wave function. Anyway, I just wanted to put this out there just in case you had kind of slipped up with this or forgot how to go from here to um, expectation values if you've always known them. All right, so notice, notice that this is actually really quite, quite easy. I mean, it's really quite straightforward. Just take the expectation value of, uh, you know what the perturbation is. You know what the zeroth order wave functions are. And so just do the expectation value and tack that onto the energy. Ta-da! I mean, it's really not that hard at all. Um, next thing I'm going to do, let me solve for the wave functions. Um, rarely do you see actually people do this, um, but I should show you how to do it. And, um, and then the higher order corrections, uh, then I'll, I'll do one higher order correction for energy and we'll stop there. And that's because professionally, that's as much as I ever see anyone do. Uh, obviously, we could keep going and going on to infinity, but again, you know, one of the reasons that you, you want a, pra a practicing faculty member teach this class is, I know generally what is like, I know what people do with this stuff. And I can tell you that generally you see people make first order corrections, and that's generally about it. So, anyway, we'll go a little further with it.
Um, you're not going to use this board. You know, not, to do, not to do that a long time ago, and there's something wrong. Um, it's broken, so that's fine. Um, tell you what, I am going to just turn off the. Um, I'm going to just turn off the camera and just wipe out the board. classroom again I can see that this board is actually broken so there's a mistake all right so now what we're going to do now that we've got the first order correction of the energy let's do the first order correction to the wave function all right to do that we'll start here back to where we were um, sorry sorry a second ago oh and I want to point out when I have this n that means like, are you trying to solve the ground state? So let's say that's n equals 1. Uh, n equals 0, I guess, if that's a harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator is a weird one. The quantum number, the principal quantum number for the ground state is 0. It's usually 1 for most things. So that, that's an odd one. Oops, I'm going to draw a frog and draw a cat. Anyway, so n, let's say n of 1 is ground state, n of 2 is first excited state. So you can apply perturbation theory to correct for the energies and wave functions of any state. But usually we're going to talk about ground state because, obviously. Anyway, just wanted to point that out that you can do this for excited states. Okay. All right, now what i got to do is i got to solve this thing. All right, that's the, that's the point I've solved. And I'm assuming I've solved the energy. Now I can solve the wave function. All right. So let me group... Um, I can, uh, I can bring um, this over here and factor out the state and then whatever's on the left, which are just, um, just the ground state, the unperturbed energy, there's the potential, here's the unperturbed uh, wave function. Okay, now here's a trick, and I'll explain I've actually told you why this works, and I'm going to even get more into it, um, let's see, two lectures from now. But remember, all right, so, so you already know this. Um, you know what the potential is because it was given. You, you know the wave functions for the unperturbed case. Uh, what the, sorry, Jesus, look at that. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. <clears throat> Now, I have said a zillion times, more at the beginning of class, that the set of states, ground state, first excited state, second excited state, third excited state, yada, 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 typically there's an infinite number, except for spin, there was only up and down. That's an unusual case. For things like harmonic oscillators and particle and boxes and hydrogen atoms, there's an infinitely large number of excited states. They span all Hilbert space, remember that term? It means that this thing can be written as a linear combination of that complete basis, right? So let me let me write that out. Uh, remember, you're not doing that here; you're doing it here. So what I'm doing is, however, the first order correction looks. It it doesn't matter what it is, or you know, or what the potential is, or the cat is the it's a cat potential, whatever. Uh, it can be expressed as some kind of weighing factor, some, some percent composition uh, times the unperturbed states, because the unperturbed states span all states. There's nothing that the cat could draw that I can't fit with a linear combination of an infinite number of basis states, because they span all space. That's what that means. Now, k is just a dummy variable. Um, again, let's, let's go from the ground state to, uh, ground state we'll call 1, n of 1 is the ground state, and to an infinite number of states. And, and this isn't sort of, it's equal. If I only went to the 1 or 2 or 3 states, it, this would be a sort of. But if I go to in, you know, infinite number of states, then it's 100% it's true that, these, that this can be expressed as that. All right, now, now I'm going to put that into here. 
and we might get, um, uh, let's see, I'm going to um, just assume that the summation is for k. Now remember that these are eigenstates of, of the unperturbed Hamiltonian, so this guy can work on that guy. Um, of course, uh, here is the energy of whatever state we're working on. Let's assume it's a ground state. And of course, k of 2 and above are excited states. k of 1 is the buzz also the ground state. Um, and again, uh, don't do a double take when I don't do anything here on the right. Uh, remember that this, what I've just drawn, is the unperturbed uh, state. Again, we'll assume that is one of the ground state. Okay. Okay, now, again, I'm going to do something that's going to that's gonna be like, why are you doing that? Why am I doing it? Because I'm going to get to the answer real quick. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply on the left, bear in mind myself, I'm going to project um, I'm going to project a state. Um, so again, this is important. We have to, as I mentioned, we can use perturbation theory to figure out what the ground state are. It is the first excited state, on and on and on. Let's just say that we're trying to do perturbation theory on the ground state. It's just way easier to just think that way. Okay, I'm going to project on the left by a state that's not the ground state. It will be an excited state of, of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. Now, why? Because I'm going to get to the answer real quick that way. It seems arbitrary. Again, I'm going to project on the left with some state that's not the unperturbed ground state. That's all because we're working with, we're trying to do perturbation theory on the ground state. So, and this is not that. All right, so anyways, what do you get? What do you get? Okay. Now, remember that um, uh, that the Hamiltonian is working on its own states. So those are zeroth order energies. Um, and here is the projection of that sum, that sum over all states onto this state, which is any state except the ground state, because we're assuming that we're doing the n equals 1 corrections. Uh, and then this guy, um, you don't do much with this. And again, the same deal um, with whatever, whatever this thing is. Um, of course, these are um, delta functions. I'll write that out in a second. Uh, okay, so then I am going to project uh, I, I'm just distributing this this uh, ground state. And maybe you just notice why I'm doing this because I just simplified it. I'll put that out in a second. Okay. All right. So so why did I do that? Well, number one, that's zero, right? What's the projection again? We're saying n equals one is the ground state, and this is any state but the ground state. What's the projection of a state into a state that's not it, that's not itself? Orthonormality, because that's zero. Right? So you see, I just wiped out a term. That's fantastic. Right? I always want to wipe out a term. Look at that. I've got, I've got the same thing here. Right? So that means I can do some factoring. Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I'm thinking it did. Okay. Now, another projection. And these are the unperturbed wave functions. Here and here, it's the same thing. Okay, so what happens is, I am looking from ground state to first excited state, second excited state, third excited state, all right? This is a state, it's just not the ground state. So it's zero unless k is equal to m. So what I've done is, right, it's a delta function. It's a Kronecker delta function. Remember, you've got to be careful about that. I and mean, this is the same Kronecker delta function. So uh, what, what, what I've done is everywhere you see a k, you write an m. You get rid of the sum. The sum is now gone uh, because all the sums, all the terms of the sum except one is zero. And the only term that is not zero 
is where k is equal to m. So wherever there's a k, there's now an m. I get rid of the summations, and every k becomes an m. That's what that does. Right? We've done this a couple of times. So what you're left with is a to the k. No, that's a to the m, for all the reasons I just said. Uh, that e to the k zero is e to the m zero, because everywhere k is not m is now zero. And again, you see how this distributes. Okay, got to be a little careful here. Um, right, that's, right, you can see the energies. The energies are not the same. The coefficients, which is what we're solving for, so we can get this wave function, are there. The energies are different. And then the only thing left on the right side is this. Um, now, remember the high gluten word we like to use, matrix element. That the word for that is a matrix element, but you know that that's an expectation value um, of the end state onto the, again, we're assuming that this is the ground state, and this is an excited state. Uh, so here, this will be a little bit more clear what is happening, um, where I will now figure out what this, see, you see what I've done here? Uh, now that I, so I know that I've switched from K to M, but, but whatever. What I'm solving for are the expansion coefficients for the first order correction in terms of the basis of unperturbed wave functions. Uh, again, maybe maybe that just went over your head. So let me let me just finish writing this out, and it will be a little bit easier to digest when you see what it is I'm trying to talk about. There you go. I mean, that, that's where we end. Okay. So, all right, with that, now, now again, the, here's the take home. The, um, okay, so we've talked about Hamiltonians, you know the solution for, but there's a perturbation, and maybe you're being lazy and you don't want to solve for the new wave functions and the new energies, or maybe you can't, as is the case with like, like a helium atom when there's two electrons interacting. Uh, we've talked about how to solve the energy correction, which is usually all you care about. But if you want to know the wave functions, what I've done is um, um, I'm solving for the first order corrections of the wave function. And what you do is, again, assuming that this is the ground state, what you do is you sum over all states that are not, again, n equals 1, that are not the ground state. So that means that this is an infinitely long sum, assuming that there's an infinite number of eigenstates, which is usually the case, but of course, usually only the first few, two or three, ever matter. And so we have this weighing coefficient of that state's energy minus the state of interest um, energy that in the unperturbed uh, state. So there you go. So again, what you get is um, the correction factor is you take the unperturbed state and you add in all the excited states wave functions with a weighing factor. That is the expectation value of the potential um, divided by the difference in energy. So remember I was saying that Usually, when you're trying to solve the uh, perturbed ground state uh, wave function, only the first couple of excited states matter. It's because that denominator, yeah, that denominator, that gets big real quick, and so they don't really matter so much. Um, and of course, now you only have to worry about is that matrix element, uh, is that matrix element zero or not? So that's the only time that uh, uh, that's the only thing you have to worry about. Okay, next problem. I do need to show you second order energy correction, which is actually quick, uh, and then we're going to do an application. All right, so I'm going to wipe out the board. It'll take me a little bit of time. I'm going to cut off the video, and I'll be right back. All right, everyone, I'm back. So we're going to do second order. Uh, that was all first order. Now we're going to do second order uh, for the energy. And again, I've never seen anyone solve second order wave functions or go to third order, uh, regardless. Um, let's go back to an expansion we had a little while ago. Uh, I deleted it, but um, um, remember when I first wrote out 
all the um, uh, all the orders of lambda, and when you grouped all those lambdas together, when you grouped all those lambdas together, those lambdas all just dropped out. So you, you read all this like highfalutin language about uh, we'll we'll allow lambda from vary to vary from zero to one, yet it never matters. So I don't know why anyone says that. It's stupid. Um, anyway, so there's a pattern here, right? Um, two, one, two, one, zero. I don't know why my ones look like dashes, right? That's first order correction must look proper. See, we don't have any paper towels in here, by the way. So sorry about the board. I'm not going to come in here again. Big mistake. Anyway, but I'm here now. All right. So there's this jazz. Guess what? Let's act on the left with the bra, which is the ground state. Again, we're assuming that we're, we're modeling the ground state. Uh, the ground state bra, why are we doing that? Because, of course, it's going to give us the answer very quickly. And there's a second order correction. Again, we're not going to actually solve for that wave function. And yes, I have to write all this out again, which sucks, but here we are. And um, one reason to do this, um, anyway, I'm off my train of thought there. Um, probably a good time to just hit fast forward <laughs> on the uh, on the video. I have to teach undergrads next semester, and I was thinking about doing that for for this stuff. Okay, okay, so there we go. All right, what is that bodice? Looks hideous, right? But of course, of course we know that um, there's going to be some easy, easy things to do here. Um, okay, again, the Hamiltonian, oh God, that's H0. That's the second time I've done that. Uh, we'll have that as a Hermitian operator. It'll act on the left, so that will do this. See, see that those terms get wiped out. Anyway, here I've got to I've got to write out the rest of it. Uh, now, as you can imagine, this term, not a lot I can do about that, so that's going to end up staying. This term is on the left side, so it's actually gone. But I have to write it out anyway. Uh, I'm going to have to write out. I'm going to have to write this thing. And then, okay, that's one, so I can just write. Remember, second order, it's not squared. <laughs> it's like when you run out of Greek letters. Uh, anyway, okay, so now what? Okay, okay, all right. So here is on the left of the equal, here is on the right of the equal. Let me double check, they're the same. Okay, so those get wiped out. Uh, as usual, I'm just solving for the second, I'm trying to solve for the second order energy. Um, uh, um, let's see here. Um, now what have I got? I have got. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right now, hold on. Let's take a look at that. What is the projection of the unperturbed state onto the correction factor? This is real subtle. This is real subtle. Remember. Well, it's right. Jesus, it's right here. What's wrong with it? It's right here. It involves all the states except the except the state that you're trying to fix. In other words, if you're trying to fix the ground state, the correction factors all come from the next state and up. So if you project this, which is the sum of states of all states except this one, that matrix element, that overlap, is zero because this is not represented in here. Because specifically for that reason, these are all states that are not the end state. So, so this is really this is really not n, right? So that's zero. OK, anyway. So this is a subtlety. Now be careful of this. If you're reading your notes, 
like a week from now or a year from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now, which is what I did for this class, you're going to look at that and say, why is that zero? Anyway, just saying. All right, so now what do we got? Um, so we've got the second order correction, not squared, it's the second order correction um, is equal to, it's equal to this. Expand this out. Uh, remember that, that that is the first order. So, so you see what you do here. Remember the first order correction is incredibly easy. It's the expectation value of the unperturbed wave functions with the perturbing potential. It, it's just as it's about the easiest thing you could ever have run into. This thing says do the same thing, except um, you know, you've got your complex conjugate, your potential, but on the right side, you've got your first order corrected wave function. So it's actually, it's like the same thing, it's just you've got a better wave function on one side of the expectation value. So let me, let me write this out um, because um, um, it's something I, I should do. And I will write this out in expectation value form. Um, and here's what I wrote just a, a second ago. Again, all states except the state that you're fixing, matrix element difference in energy, which can be important. Oh, yes. There we go. I, I know I should write that the other way. But uh, there you go. Okay. Um, now this, God, that looks awful. Uh, this, this is easy. And one of the things that you have to also get good at, and I may have a homework on this, and I'm going to do an example, is when you see this, I, I do like this because this looks easy. And then when you actually do it, you do run into some complications. And it can get a little sucky, but again, you're the ones who want PhDs, right? And you can kind of see a little bit of that here. This looks nice, and then when I write it out a little bit more exactly, it's a little bit like, eh. Um, okay, now, to solidify all this junk, I shouldn't call it junk, to solidify all this junk, let's do an example. I'm just going to do a first order correction, and, um, and I'm also going to get into some atomic theory, because I'm really actually not going to cover uh, atoms and molecules, which is kind of crazy, and I'll talk more about why that is. But I don't want you to forget that, that these things exist and some of the rules that govern how you deal with wave functions for atoms and molecules. I'm going to do a hydrogen atom because why not? Uh, let me raise the board and I'll start on that and I'll probably spill over until the next, uh, till Monday's class. five minutes left in this class. I will try to stick with that, but time gets kind of funky when there's no one in here. This really is weird, by the way. Um, I've been doing this for almost a year now. Okay, so what we're gonna do is the helium, helium ground state energy via perturbation theory. So we're gonna, you know, I wanna make sure that you kind of remember how wave functions for things that are real, not, not these free waves or whatnot. So I want, I want you to remember this stuff um, and also emphasize that, let's see here, let me write out the Hamiltonian. So actually here, hold on, let me, let me just remind you that helium has an atomic number of two, so it has a charge of two. Uh, the number of electrons is two, and again, you, you know that. And we're going to say, we're going to say both are 1s. So we have a, um, 
we have a 1s2 configuration, which is a ground state. So one spin up, one spin down. That actually isn't terribly important in this case. So, um, uh, so, so anyway, so we're going to work with this. Right, so what? Okay, let me write down the Hamiltonian, and, and I'll show you where things go crazy. Uh, we've got the momentum of the first state. Of course, its mass is that of an electron. Uh, there's a second electron. Has the same mass. That's convenient. Now it's going to interact with the nucleus. Now that E, that E is the number of coulombs of an electron. Okay, so, um, so the nucleus has Z E charge plus Z E charge. In this case, it's two two E's of charge because a proton has the same charge as an electron, except it's positive. So Z E is the nucleus. And another minus E, there's the minus, and another minus E is the electron itself. That's Coulomb's law. R1 is because there's, that's the first electron, of course the second electron sees the same thing. Don't let Mathematica think that that's like 2.7 squared, right? Because that's what it'll think. Um, you have to be careful about how you define that. Okay, now if this is all you have, we're going to call this H0. This is just a hydrogen atom that happens to have two electrons. The solution would be the wave function for an electron, one, times the wave function for an electron, two, where that wave function is basically a hydrogen, one S state, which we solve as undergrads. It's basically e to the minus r over a naught, where a naught is a bore. e to the minus r, right? e to the minus r one times e to the minus r two. There you go, that's really all there is. Normalization, yeah, no, no. The angular parts is just one over the square root of four pi, right? Because uh, S states, um, the, the theta and phi, there's no theta and phi, there's no cosine, there's no sine, any of that, right? That's S states are easy. That's why I'm doing this. That's the solution until I do this. Oh, I, you know, I forgot all those, sorry, you know what? I have 1 over 4 pi e naught, 1 over 4 pi e naught. Sometimes you just, if you assume that 1 over 4 pi e naught is the number 1, and I'll talk more about that some other time. Uh, so it's kind of traditional to just drop the 1 over 4 pi e naught. Sorry about that. That's a bit of a mistake. I, I kind of regret doing that, but I'm, I'm stuck here now. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Okay, here's the perturbing potential. The electrons are interacting with each other. Okay, what the major problem is, is the reason that up until we added this is technically a separable Hamiltonian, right? All the angles, there, and there are no angles, but anyway, uh, but the R's, R1 and R2, these are separated. So you can solve, so it ends up dissolving itself. Um, you can reconfigure it into two miniature Schrodinger equations, one for electron one, one for electron two. Guess what? They have to be identical, except that one is given an R1 label, the other is given an R2 label. The solution is the two solutions multiplied, so wave function one times wave function two, e to the uh, minus r one times e to the minus r two. It's unbelievably easy. But when you add this, you cannot separate the Hamiltonian. If you cannot separate the Hamiltonian, you cannot write the wave functions as wave function one times wave function two. Now this is horribly important. As a PhD student, you should know this. Without the ability to separate the Hamiltonian, you cannot say, you cannot dissolve this into miniature Schrodinger equations, the solutions to which you just multiply them together to answer the big Hamiltonian. So I cannot, because this thing right there, I cannot solve miniature Schrodinger equations. I cannot resolve this into the form of wave function for electron one times wave function of electron two. I cannot do that. In fact, mathematicians, you know, so I'm a chemist and I'm stymied by this. Mathematicians look at this and say, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can never solve this. Not straightforward. There's no e to the minus r1 plus something times e to the minus r2 plus something or minus something or something, something, something. There's no something. It doesn't exist. Heads up. What you do is you, like, you solve this on a supercomputer, not with e to the minus r's, but with 3.1415, right? There's a numerical solution. There is a solution, but it comes in the form of a giant set of numbers, not a giant set of e to the minus r's. Uh, so that's, that's what's going to happen. 
Okay, now with that said, I have no choice but to start with the unperturbed Hamiltonian, for which I know the solutions and the energies. I know that the energy of a hydrogen atom is minus 3.14 electron volts. 13 points, God, oh my God, what did I just say? Minus 13.6 electron volts is how much energy is, uh, that exists in the 1s state between a proton and an electron in a hydrogen 1s state. Uh, and then I'm going to tack that on. And you can have to make a couple of other adjustments because you actually have two electrons. So basically, we can, um, the electrons are the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve all these energies. Uh, we're just going to multiply by two because there's two electrons. And then we're going to do perturbation theory on this. That's the plan. All right, so I'm at the end of this hour, and uh, I'm going to stop here. We're going to solve this problem on Monday. Actually, you'll be seeing me wearing the same thing, because I'm going to come back and finish this. Um, and I will not be here, because I hate this classroom. This is completely screwed up. I'm going to go back to the other classroom, and I will see you all then. <laughs>